Hello, this is Dr. Marty Klein. Today I want to tell you why the concept of sex addiction is so terribly unhelpful and even potentially dangerous for people with psychological problems. The concept of sex addiction was invented in the 1980s by Patrick Corrance, a prison addictionologist with no professional training in human sexuality. It quickly caught on with the public and with many marriage counselors who usually get no training about everyday sexual feelings, desires, and behaviors, or the shame and the guilt and the terror that can go with ordinary sexuality for some people. Tellingly, the concept of sex addiction never caught on with the one professional group who have training, expertise, and experience in working with sexual issues, and that's sex therapists. Sex therapists see plenty of compulsive and impulsive behavior around sex, we see almost endless infidelity, lots of men misusing pornography or going to sex workers, women and men troubled by their fantasies, preferences, and desires, people who are in fact almost paralyzed by sexual shame, guilt, and terror. But we have clinical tools much more sophisticated than the concept of sex addiction, and we have more effective treatment strategies than dooming people to weekly groups literally spending the rest of their lives in recovery from their lifelong disease of sex addiction. So who are sex addicts? Well, we've learned a lot about people who call themselves sex addicts. Some of them have a diagnosable mental health problem obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, Asperger's syndrome, borderline personality. Some self-identified sex addicts are crippled by enormous levels of anger or low self-esteem. These people may make many bad choices involving sex, but they don't actually have a sex problem. Just as someone with obsessive compulsive disorder who washes their hands 30 times a day, they don't have a hand washing problem. Some people who call themselves sex addicts do act impulsively like children. If they want something, they just grab it. These people flirt or go to prostitutes or wake their partners for sex at 3 a.m. or masturbate instead of going to work, despite promising themselves or others that they won't. When confronted, they apologize, they swear they won't do it again, and then they do it again. They don't exactly have a sex problem. They have not learned how to manage their impulses. Some of these people are so narcissistic, they don't think they should have to manage their impulses. Some people who call themselves sex addicts are in a couple with someone who doesn't want sex very much or doesn't want much variety or the one special thing that the addict really wants. These people build up a mountain of resentment and instead of leaving the relationship or engaging in productive marital conflict, they become freelance sexual operators, whether with sex workers or colleagues or strangers. And now we come to perhaps the largest group of would-be sex addicts, people who experience their own sexuality as dangerous, as outside the realm of what's normal, their fantasies, their desire to masturbate, their curiosity about one or another taboo, their wish to simply know what other people do or feel in bed, they experience themselves as degenerate, not deserving of comfort or compassion or connection. And that can drive people crazy. It's even worse if these people are pressured by a demand that they be pure, by a strict ethnic culture, a punitive God, or a perfectionist church. In the old days, those people might go into exile or do arduous purification rituals, or they might project their disgust with themselves onto a wife or children with abuse or violence. Such people have always had the option of escaping their pain with alcohol. We see that like, uh, quite a bit. And now they have another option, identifying as sex addicts. They acquire the core belief that they're out of control, which can actually be comforting when compared to the alternatives, being sinful, being disgusting, or being extraordinarily selfish carelessly hurting the people they love. As a sex addict, they're welcomed back into the human race. They have the dignity of a disease. They have an instant community of other addicts, and they can disown their urges as not their own, but as the addiction speaking. Crucially, sex addicts are immediately offered a container for their devastating shame. They get to share their horrible secrets and receive genuine sympathy. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're told that they're okay 
and that with enough work, their sexuality won't be so powerful anymore. For these people, that's something to look forward to. Well, if I see patients damaging their lives with bad sexual decisions, and if I don't call it sex addiction, what do I call it? Well, what I call it is one of the following. It could be typical human sexuality with repetition driven by shame. It could be a diagnosable mental health disorder, such as bipolar disorder or Asperger's syndrome. It could be someone in a problematic relationship that they won't confront directly. It could be someone drastically squeezed between their internal sexual architecture, the belief that they're degenerate, and external to be pure, external pressure to be pure. It could be someone with an alcohol or drug problem, which allows them to make sexual decisions that they would not make when they're sober. Ultimately, what I and other sex therapists see is people who keep making sexual decisions whose consequences they regret, and they keep making those same decisions with the same regrettable consequences. That is not an addiction. It's a recognizable feature of being human, whether the decisions are about eating cookies, buying sweaters, staying up too late on a weeknight, binge watching TV, or breaking a vow to meditate every day. Repeatedly making sexual decisions whose consequences you regret does not make you a sex addict. It makes you a flawed person who needs to change. Change whether it's changing your relationship, your integrity, your church, your alcohol use, or your mental health difficulties. How do I and other sex therapists treat this? Well, if we see un untreated depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues, we treat them often with a combination of therapy and medication. With everyone else, we do therapy. We help people, often quite substantially. And when we're done, patients aren't lifelong addicts in lifelong recovery. They're adults who have a different view of themselves, who feel human, whose impulses aren't so urgent, who make better decisions, and who aren't perfect, and who can accept that. Uncrippled by shame, they have more integrity, and they're far more likely to keep their promises. They no longer see their sexuality as dangerous. They're cured. They're not addicts anymore. They never were. I'm Dr. Marty Klein. Thanks for joining me. And hey, I publish one of these video quickies every few weeks. So if you like, hit the subscribe button at the bottom of your screen and you'll get pinged every time I publish a new one. Thanks.